Hi, my name is Dr. Frederick Edward Fabelia, and I will be discussing the overview of psychological assessment. In many ways, psychological testing and assessment are similar to medical tests. If a patient has physical symptoms, a primary care provider may order x-rays or blood tests to understand what's causing those symptoms. The results of the test will help inform and develop a treatment plan. So tests and assessments are two separate but related components of psychological evaluation. Psychologists use both types of tools to help them arrive at a diagnosis and a treatment plan. Testing involves the use of formal tests such as questionnaires or checklists. These are often described as norm reference tests. Generally, psychological assessments include a range of ways for gathering information and may include interview, observation, consultation with other professionals, and formal psychological testing. Psychological testing involves the administration, scoring, and interpreting of psychological tests. A psychological assessment is conducted by a psychologist to gather information about how people think, feel, behave, and react. The focus of a psychological assessment will vary depending on the purpose. So let's talk about the interview. Valuable information is gained through interviewing. When it's for a child, interviews are conducted not only with the child, but the parents, teachers, and other individuals familiar with the child. Interviews are more open and less structured than formal testing and give those being interviewed an opportunity to convey information in their own words. A formal clinical interview is often conducted with the individual before the start of any psychological assessment or testing. This interview can last anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes and includes questions about the individual's personal and childhood history, recent life experiences, work and school history, and family background. Rapport is perhaps the most essential ingredient to a good interview. It is the relationship between the clinician and the client. The quality and nature of that relationship will vary, of course, depending on the purpose of the interview. Okay, so let's look at the table here. There are different kinds of interview questions. Let's look at them one by one. We have the open-ended interview question when you are asked, could you describe your family? So that's open-ended. Okay, you can talk about it as much as you want. And then we have the facilitative question. If the client is reluctant to talk about something in uh, detail, you can ask facilitative questions or follow-up questions. Can you tell me more about this or that? Okay. And then you have clarifying questions. If the client is unable to answer directly your question, you want to clarify whether the client is saying something and you want to be clear about what the client is saying. Okay. When you encounter inconsistencies or contradictions in what the client is saying, you may use confronting questions, okay? And when you want a clear answer, you can just ask the question directly. So you have direct questions. Okay, so these are the five types of interview questions. What are the types of interview? The many varieties of interviews have two primary distinguishing features. First, interviews differ in their purpose. And second major distinguishing factor is whether an interview is unstructured or structured. The five common major types of interview are the intake admission interview, the case history interview, the mental status examination interview, the crisis interview, and the diagnostic interview. Let's look at these interview types one by one. Let's look at the intake admission interview. Similar to a hospital, an intake interview generally has two purposes. To determine why the patient has come to the clinic or hospital and to judge whether the agency's facilities, policies, and services will meet the needs and expectations of the patient. Otherwise, they might refer the patient or clients to some other agency that can handle his situation. Okay. 
So let's now look at the case history interview. In a case history interview, a complete personal and social history is taken. The clinician is interested both in concrete facts, dates, events, and in the patient's feelings about them. Basically, the purpose of a case history is to provide a broad background and context in which the patient and the problem can be placed. Okay, let's now go to the mental status examination interview. A mental status examination is typically conducted to assess the presence of cognitive, emotional, or behavioral problems. The items included in the MSE are the following. The clinician attempts to evaluate the appearance, behavior, and attitude of the client, how the client speaks, so the characteristics of speech, the client's affect and mood, the content of the client's thoughts and how the client is able to concentrate or pay attention, the client's orientation, whether the client's memory is affected, the general intellectual level of the client, and the client's insight and judgment. Okay, let's now go to the diagnostic interview. A structured diagnostic interview consists of a standard set of questions and follow-up probes that are asked in a specific sequence. The use of structured diagnostic interviews ensures that all patients or subjects are asked the same questions. The questions during the uh, clinical diagnostic interview are much broader and leave you room to give details. Examples of questions are, what was your childhood like? What is your relationship with your mother, father, siblings like? What was school like for you? What sort of friendships did you have as a child? What have your romantic relationships been like? What is your job and how long have you done it? Okay. Now let's go to the crisis interview. This is an interview conducted for the purposes of diffusing or problem solving through the crisis at hand and encouraging the individual to enter into a therapeutic relationship at the agency or elsewhere so that a longer term sol solution can be worked out. Okay, so there you have the different kinds of interview. Let's now go to the behavioral observation, a different kind of psychological assessment. Observations of the person being referred in their natural setting, especially if it's a child, can provide additional valuable assessment information. In the case of a child, how do they behave in school settings, at home, in the neighborhood? Does the teacher treat them differently than other children? How do their friends react to them? Functional analysis is the main tool of behavioral assessment. The triple response mode of motor, cognitive, and physiological are used to define behavioral problems and diverse potential causes multi-causality are accepted. For example, an individual's feelings of loneliness, attention, and concentration problems, sleep disturbance, and low rate of social behaviors and physical activity can be used to explain that the person is depressed. Okay? The subject several other conditions can also be used to explain the problem functionally. They include reinforcement system deficit, inadequate motivational system, and dysfunction in biological conditions. Okay, so these are all the things that you observe in behavioral observation. Let's now proceed to informal assessment. Standardized norm reference tests may at times need to be supplemented with more informal assessment procedures, such as projective tests or even career testing or teacher-made tests. So if you look at the ink blot there, what do you see? All right. For example, in the case of a child, it may be valuable to obtain language samples from the child, test the child's ability to profit from systematic cues, and evaluate the child's reading skills under various conditions. Okay, let's now proceed to psychological testing. Psychologists often undertake psychological testing of individuals, groups, or organizations that can provide valuable information 
about their perceptions, thoughts, and feelings, or their cognitive functioning, such as memory and learning. Testing is a formal process using validated and reliable measures of aspects of an individual's psychological or cognitive functioning. It might include paper and pencil tests like questionnaires and surveys or the completion of set puzzle-like activities that evaluate certain skills such as planning, memory, or problem solving. Tests can be thought of as yardsticks, but they are less efficient and reliable than actual yardsticks. A test yields one or more objectively obtained quantitative scores so that as much as possible, each person is assessed in the same way. Quantitative scores are used for objective evaluation. The intent is to provide a fair and equitable comparison among test takers. A standardized psychological test is a task or set of tasks given under standard set conditions. It is designed to assess some aspect of a person's knowledge, skill, or personality. A psychological test provides a scale of measurement for consistent individual differences regarding some psychological concept and serves to line up people according to that concept. Norm reference psychological tests are standardized on a clearly defined group, termed the norm group, and scaled so that each individual score reflects a rank within the norm group. So if you look at the graph there, you have a normal curve there. And most of the time, uh, human characteristics can be represented by a normal curve, okay? The more average your behavior is or your characteristic is, the more to the center your score will be. So the farther your score is from the center, the more you are deviating from the norm, okay? Norm reference tests have been developed to assess many areas, including intelligence, reading, arithmetic, and spelling abilities visual motor skills, gross and fine motor skills, and adaptive behavior. A norm reference test of a child's reading abilities, for example, may rank that child's ability compared to other children of similar grade or grade level. Norm reference tests have been developed and evaluated by researchers and proven to be effective for measuring a particular trait or disorder. Okay, let's talk about validity of tests. The concept of validity was formulated by Kelly, who stated that a test is valid if it measures what it claims to measure. For example, a test of intelligence should measure intelligence and not something else, like memory. A distinction can be made between internal and external validity. These types of validity are relevant to evaluating the validity of a research study or procedure. Internal validity refers to whether the effects observed in a study are due to the manipulation of the independent variable and not some other factor. In other words, there is a causal relationship between the independent and dependent variable. Internal validity can be improved by controlling extraneous value variables using standardized instructions, counterbalancing, and eliminating demand characteristics and investigator effects. So let's look at the types of validity. We have content-related and criterion-related. Okay, so let's look at these different types. So the first one is face validity. Face validity is simply whether the test appears at face value to measure what it claims to. This is the least sophisticated measure of validity. Okay, test whether in the purpose is clear, even to naive respondents are said to have high face validity. Okay, so let's look at this example. Does it look like a math test? If it does, then it has face validity. Okay. Let's now go to construct validity. Construct validity refers to the extent to which a test captures a specific theoretical construct or trait, and it overlaps with some of the other aspects of validity. To test for construct validity, it must be demonstrated that the phenomenon being measured actually exists. So, the construct validity of a test for intelligence, for example, is dependent on a model or theory of intelligence. So, let's take an example. Does motivation exist? Can we measure it? If it exists, we can measure it. Okay? So, we know that it exists, therefore it's measurable. But what about chakra? Can we measure that? 
if we cannot measure that and there is no construct validity. Okay? So, let's now talk about criterion related. The first one is construct validity. Does the relate to a existing similar measure? Okay. So, is the degree to which a test corresponds to an external criterion that is known concurrently? Okay? If the new test is validated by a comparison with a currently existing criterion, we have concurrent validity. Very often, a new IQ or personality test might be compared with an older but similar test known to have good validity already. Okay, another example. Uh, in 1965, you had the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, which is said to have high validity. Now, in 2006, there came this other self-esteem test. You want to find out if this other self-esteem test has high concurrent validity. So you give both tests, the Rosenberg and the Sorensen self-esteem test to people and see whether people who have uh, high self-esteem score the same in the same test or whether people have low self-esteem score low in both tests. Okay, so you compare the test results. All right. So let's now proceed to predictive validity. This is the degree to which a test accurately predicts a criterion that will occur in the future. For example, a prediction may be made on the basis of a new intelligence test that high scores at age 12 will be more likely to obtain university degrees several years later. Okay, if the prediction is borne out, then the test has predictive validity. A very common example of that are aptitude tests, all right? Okay, let's now go to reliability. The term reliability in psychological research refers to the consistency of a research study or measuring test. For example, if a person weighs themselves, like in the picture there, during the course of a day, you would expect that you would weigh the same throughout the day. What if the scores are different? You weigh different at different times of the day. Will there be reliability? Okay, so there are two types of reliability, internal and external reliability. Internal reliability assesses the consistency of results across items within a test, while external validity refers to the extent to which a measure varies from one use to another. Okay, let's look at the different types of reliability. You have internal and you have external. Let's consider the first kind of internal reliability, which is slip, split method, split half method. The split half method assesses the internal consistency of a test such as a psychometric test or questionnaire. There it measures the extent to which all parts of the test contribute equally to what is being measured. This is done by comparing the results of one half of a test with the results of the other half. So a test can be split in half in several ways, first half, second half, or by odd and even numbers. If the two halves of the test provide similar results, this would suggest that the test has internal reliability. Okay, an example here. So if you have a 10-item test, you want to find out if it has internal reliability, you use the split half method. You split it, okay? All the odd numbers and all the even numbers, and you give these as two separate tests and find out if the scores are Similar to the people you give it to, you compare their results, okay? That establishes internal reliability. Okay, so now let's proceed to test retest. Okay, so external reliability this time. The test retest method assesses the external consistency of a test. Examples of appropriate tests include questionnaires and psychometric, psychometric tests. It measures the stability of a test over time. A typical assessment would involve giving participants the same test on two separate occasions. If the same or similar results are obtained, then external reliability is established. Okay, let's look at this. So I have the uh, set of people and what you do is you give them the test, first testing session, okay? And then you let time pass, maybe it's hours, maybe it's days. And then you give the same test to the same people in the second testing session. And then you compare the results, whether or not the tests are similar for the same test, okay? All right, so let's now proceed to inter-rater reliability. 
Inter-rater reliability refers to the degree to which different raters give consistent estimates of the same behavior. Inter-rater reliability can be used for interviews. Okay, so example, you have a panel of interviewers. If they use the same rubrics, will they rate or evaluate consistently the same people? Okay, so that's inter-rater reliability. Okay, that concludes my discussion on overview of psychological assessment. And thank you very much. If you want to stay updated with my upcoming lectures, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Prof. Eric F.